All right. If you have uh, if you have your Bibles, if you would uh, turn turn with me to the Epistle of First uh, Peter, it's a bit hot up here. <laughs> so, First Peter comes right before Second Peter. Uh, it's right in between uh, James and Second Peter. In my Bible, it's on page 1066, if that helps. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's pray and invite the Lord into our service again. Uh, so, Lord, we, just, we ask you to go before us. Lord, as we read and as we study your word, would you guide us, would you direct us? Lord, if I have anything to say, Lord, I pray that it would just fall on deaf ears this morning, Lord, and, and only what's of you be heard and remembered. Lord, we're here because we want to meet with you. We're here because we, we need you, Lord, and we want to be instructed by your word. And so, Lord, would you just superintend our service, Lord, and speak and minister to us. So, Lord, we open our hearts this morning to receive from you, and we give you Lord, these next few minutes, Lord, if, uh, if you want to, Lord, if you need to do business with us, Lord, we're here. Meet with us, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the book of First Peter, if you remember from last week, we did a bit of a, uh, uh, Pastor Dean brought us a bit of an introduction, took us through uh, the first couple verses. Um. And so what I'd, what I'd like to do, just for, for context, is um, I'm going to go back to verse 3 and begin reading from verse 3, and we'll read down to verse 12. So it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glorify at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets, having inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. So, as I, as I mentioned last week, we began this epistle and, and got a bit of a, an, an introduction Right, written by uh, the Apostle Peter, right, for many of us, our, our favorite apostle, right, the, the apostle that we can probably most relate to, 
right? The apostle that was constantly putting his foot in his mouth. <laughs> but we love Peter because we, we relate to Peter, right? I, I, I can't count how many times I've put my foot in my mouth. You know, but the Lord did a work in him. You know, and it's, and it's been several decades, right, since, since the Lord has, has left, right? And, and the Lord has done a work in Peter. And here, Peter, writing us this epistle, right, he says that it's, it's to the pilgrims or the sojourners of the dispersion, he says, right, that, that people have been dispersed, all around Asia Minor, and, and he calls them pilgrims. He calls them sojourners. So he's writing to, to Christians, mostly Gentiles, that are scattered throughout the area of Asia Minor. So he wrote this epistle for the purpose that it be passed along, right, shared from church to church, that these, that these truths and this, this encouragement um, could, could be for, for everyone. And so he says pilgrims, sojourners. You know, a fugitive, a fugitive is someone who is running from their home. A vagabond is someone who is, who is wandering without a home. A pilgrim is someone who is journeying home. And a sojourner is someone who is just staying as a temporary resident in a foreign land. Peter here in, this, in this, this epistle is writing, he says, to pilgrims and to sojourners. You see, that's what we are. As believers, this is not our home, right? As believers, this is just a temporary residence. We are sojourning here but it's not our permanent place. We are pilgrims. We are journeying home. We're here, and, and we journey while temporary residents, but our permanent residence, right, is in heaven, is before God. And so we are pilgrims. We are sojourners. We are here temporarily, but we are journeying home. So he's writing to pilgrims and to sojourners, those who are, who are on a journey home, but currently temporary residence in a foreign land. In fact, in, uh, in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Right? Peter here is, is writing this epistle to encourage believers, right? knowing and acknowledging that, that whatever we're going through, it's temporary. We're on a journey. We're, we're moving. Right? Hopefully in our Christian life as we, as we navigate this world that we're not just stagnant and staying still, but we are moving, we are journeying with the Lord as he, as he directs us. So Peter here is, is telling us and encouraging us in this epistle how to conduct ourselves as temporary residents of this world. Peter uses some key words in this epistle, key words like suffering, grace, and hope. So we have to remember, as, as Pastor Dean shared with us last week, that, that the believers in this time, this epistle written probably some, somewhere in the, the mid to, to late 60s, most, most scholars say somewhere between 64 and 68 AD, that Nero, the emperor of Rome, has, has come to reign, and, and in the summer of 68 began his his heavy persecution on the church. And so he's writing to a church that is suffering, that is struggling, that is under great persecution. And so he's writing to help them and show them how they are to conduct themselves, as he says there in, in chapter 2, right? As we are sojourners and pilgrims, that we are to abstain from fleshly lusts, 
which war against our souls, and that we are to conduct ourselves on, in honorable among the Gentiles, that by our good works, which they observe, should glorify God in the day of visitation. He'll say in chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, he says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He says, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering, sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, Peter's saying, yeah, Nero might be persecuting you, but there is a greater force at play, right? That your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he says to be vigilant. And he also encourages them, saying that you're not alone, that these same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Right? That sometimes sufferings, trials, temptations, testings happen in life. That we have an enemy. And so the encouragement in this epistle from Peter is to stand fast. Yes, suffering happens, but stand fast in grace and in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of your suffering and your persecution. So as we jump in this morning, as we look at these things, you know, and as I, as I kept reading this passage, what kept coming out to me was, was just the importance of salvation. He's writing to believers. Peter's writing to the church. He's writing to a persecuted church, a suffering church. And what he's, I think, trying to call out to them here in these first 12 verses is to cling to the importance of their salvation. So what I want to do is drop back a little bit and kind of look at the, the importance of our salvation. I want to look at the truths about our salvation. I want to look at the rejoicing we have in our salvation. And I want to look at the messengers of salvation. And so some of those truths about salvation... If we want to just back up to verse 3 real quick, it says, Blessed be God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The truth about sal salvation, one of which is it's a blessing. It's a blessing. When Peter considered the salvation of God, his immediate response was simply to praise him. Right? And that's, that's why we're here, right? That's why we, we spent time in worship this morning, to praise him. Right? To honor him for the blessing of our salvation. In Luke 24, it says, Now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. When Jesus left, when he ascended into heaven, their response was to bless him. They worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. You know, it's interesting, James, you know, if we just turn a couple pages over, James says, but no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not be so. You know, isn't it amazing that, and, and I've been guilty of this so many times, right? Like we can, we can come, we can come into this place and we can worship God with our tongues, with our voices. And then we can leave here and get on the road and instantly say something we regret. Man, the power of the tongue. Right? In one breath we can praise God and in the next breath we can curse our brethren. 
But Peter here encouraging us, saying it's a blessing. Our salvation is a blessing, and we get to, we get to give that back to the Lord. We get to praise him and bless him for what he's done in and through us. We have the ability to either bless God or to curse him. You know, and there really isn't any in-between. We're either blessing him or cursing him. Peter here is encouraging us to bless the Lord. And why? Because he has begotten us. Because we have been born again. We've been made new by the blood of Jesus. Because of his resurrection. And so the truth of our salvation should cause us to bless the Lord. And that's, again, that's why worship is so important. It's not just words on a screen. And I hope and I pray that we're not just coming and reading words on a screen, but it's really a, a, an expression of our hearts as we pour it back to the Lord. Right, when we s- sing those words, right, Lord, I need you every, I hope that's true in our lives. Lord, I need you. You know, but our salvation, it's not, just, it's not just about blessing, it's also about mercy. It's about mercy. Notice what it says there. Who according to his abundant mercy. His abundant mercy. All of his goodness to us, it begins with his mercy. You know, no other attribute of God could have helped us had his mercy been refused. We are by nature condemned. God's justice would condemn us without his mercy. Holiness would frown upon us. His power would crush us. His truth would confirm the threatening of the law. And his wrath would fulfill it. It is from the mercy of God that all our hopes begin. Charles Spurgeon. His mercy. You know, justice, justice is is the concept that individuals are to be treated in a manner that is equitable and fair. We might say, justice is getting what you deserve. Receiving good things because you deserve them or receiving judgment because you deserve it justice getting what we deserve grace on the other hand grace is usually defined as as undeserved or unmerited favor grace is something that cannot be earned it is something that can only be freely given see justice is something you earn right something you can acquire grace you can't earn it Grace can only be given. We might say grace is getting that which you do not deserve. You don't deserve it, but it's given anyway. Amen, Amen, right? The grace of God. But Peter here is talking about God's mercy. Mercy. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or to harm. Compassion, forgiveness. We might say mercy is not getting that which we do deserve. What do we deserve? God's judgment and wrath because we are sinners. But what do we receive? Forgiveness, mercy. And that's why I love so often when these epistles start, they start off with grace and mercy. Grace and peace. Paul said in Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Listen, we are all sinners. And I love that, right? The ground before the cross is level. We all come to the cross the same way and in the same condition. We all come... As sinners in need of a savior. David would say in Psalm 51, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. See, we're born this way. 
We're born in iniquity. We're born sinners. It is the human condition. We are all born into sin. And so what is it that we deserve? It's God's judgment. His justice. He is a righteous and a holy God. He cannot be in the presence of sin. And that is what we are, sinners. What do we deserve? His judgment. But what does he give us? His mercy. Right? He offers us forgiveness. We deserve God's justice, right? Justice is getting what we deserve. The punishment, the consequence for our sins. But what God offers us is grace and mercy. He offers us mercy, right? He doesn't give us what we deserve. He, gives, he offers us compassion and forgiveness. And he offers us grace. He gives us something, that unmerited favor, that which we do not deserve. You know, I love what Lamentation says, right? Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I love that, right? He doesn't just offer us mercy once. It's new every morning, Solomon would say. Your mercies are new every morning. Get that. Every single morning, God holds back his justice. He holds back his wrath, that which we deserve. Why? Why is God so merciful to us? Why does he offer it to us? It's simple. It's because he loves us. It's because of his love. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5, right? But God, who is rich in mercy, why? Because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. He loves us. And so he bestows his mercy upon us. But his salvation isn't just a blessing. It isn't just about his mercy, but it's also about hope. It's about hope. It says he has begotten us again to a living hope. Not just any hope, a living hope. You know, this, this world, this world has a dead hope, which isn't really hope at all, really, when you think about it. But what is this world hoping in, hoping for, looking at? Nothing. It's dead. Hebrews 6.19 says, This hope we have as an anchor for our soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Colossians 2.27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is our hope. Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, is our hope, our living hope. You know, I love that song, right? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. What does this world have to hope on? It's sinking sand. Anything this world puts its hope in is sinking sand, but our hope is on the rock. Our hope is on the person of Jesus Christ. It's not our circumstances. It's not our situation. It's not our bank account. It's on Jesus and if it's on anything other than Jesus, it's sinking sand. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. That is where our hope is. It is on Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's why his resurrection is so important. 
right? Peter tells us that, that our salvation is made real through the resurrection of Jesus. Remember, Peter is instructing his readers the, the important truths of salvation. And why is Jesus' resurrection so important for our salvation? That Jesus was raised from the dead so that we might be justified. That we might have a right standing before God. Paul says in Romans, who was delivered up, speaking about Jesus, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised for our justification. Psalm 103 reminds us that that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions. Hebrews 10, 17 says, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. God forgives. He forgets. He imputes to us his righteousness. Why? Because Christ was raised from the dead. Because he conquered the grave. Because he is our living hope. His resurrection guarantees our future resurrection. Right? If he didn't conquer the grave, if he wasn't resurrected, if he didn't defeat death, then what hope do we have? None. Jesus said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Our hope is in his resurrection, the fact that he conquered the grave. How about this? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Now, if if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how is it that some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then that means Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. See, Paul arguing the fact that, like, you you say there's no resurrection... But if there's no resurrection, then Christ couldn't have been raised from the dead. And if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then what we are preaching is empty and futile. He says that if Christ is not risen, you are still in your sins. You know, I always love that reminder when you're you're reading the Gospels and you come across the Pharisees and the Sadducees and it was always easy to remember the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection and so they were sad, you see. (laughs) That's how I remember it. But that's what Paul's talking about here. If, If there's no resurrection, if there's no raising from the dead, if Jesus wasn't raised, then we don't have a future resurrection either and we're just still in our sins. And so the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, the fact that he conquered the grave, is what gives us our living hope. We have a living hope because he is living. Because he is alive. And so we have this inheritance. In verse 4 he says, To an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, it does not fade away, it's reserved in heaven for you. Right? An inheritance. And not just any, any, just not just any inheritance, an eternal one. Our salvation is eternal. He says there that it is incorruptible. It is not subject to decay. It will not perish. 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, And everyone who um, competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain obtain a perishable crown, but we 
for an imperishable crown. Right? What God offers to us through salvation is incorruptible. It won't decay, it won't perish, it won't wither away. It's also undefiled, he says. Right? It's not blemished or soiled in any way. It can't be tainted. He says it does not fade away. It can't be extinguished. It can't be put out like a fire. The eternal nature of our salvation, it is incorruptible, it is undefiled, it does not fade. In a couple chapters, in in chapter 5, verse 4, Peter's going to say, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Man, that encourages me. Right? We're not clinging to something that's going to be corrupted one day. You know, I, uh, <laughs> you know I'm, a, I'm a mechanic. I fix cars for a living. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating, especially here in New England, fixing cars because everything gets rusted and corrupted, right? Trying to get some of these rusted and corroded bolts out, you know? In fact, in fact whenever I, I buy something and if I open a box and it has a silicate, those silicate packets, you know what I'm talking about? I save those. And I keep them in the drawers of my toolbox so that my tools don't rust and corrode while they sit there. I'm, right? This is where we live. Right? We live in a world that is corruptible and is subject to decay. But our salvation is incorruptible, undefiled, and cannot fade away. In fact, it says it is reserved for us in heaven. Reserved. Kept. Guarded. It means to watch over. Colossians 1, 4, and 5, Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. It's all speaking of the eternal nature of our salvation, our inheritance. He calls it an inheritance. An inheritance is the practice of receiving Right? An inheritance is receiving property or titles or uh, um, entitlements, different privileges or rights upon the death of an individual. Right? When someone passes away and you wonder what was in their will, what you stand to inherit. But the inheritance is only given out by the death of a person. Much like our inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled that doesn't fade away, that is stored up, saved for us, guarded in heaven. Why? Because of the death of a person. Our inheritance gets paid out because Jesus died for us. Because he paid the penalty. John 10, 28 says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Man, the eternal nature of God's salvation for us. It can't be taken from us. It can't be, it, it's not faded, undefiled. It can't be corrupted. It's reserved in heaven for you. You who are kept by the power of God through faith. You who are kept by the power of God. Kept is a military term, and it means to protect or to guard, right? Picture the military standing guard and protecting something, keeping something safe. We are kept by the power of God. Our our salvation is protected, is guarded by the power of God. Paul would say in, in Romans chapter 8, Verses 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
It is kept, guarded, protected by the power of God. Nothing. Paul's like, death? It's nothing. Life? Angels? Powers? Principalities? Things present? Things that are coming, right? We can get so worked up about what tomorrow might bring. Why? I know who holds tomorrow. Right? That we serve a God who keeps us by his power. No created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul would say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He would, he would tell the, the church um, in, in 1 Corinthians, he says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The power of God. And so we have these important truths, and I, th- I wanted to, to take a moment to go back and just kind of look at some of those truths about our salvation. Because while they are powerful, while they are significant, while we need them, the truth is that this life in Christ, it's not always easy, is it? It's not always, faith, I guess, is simple, but like this Christian life, it's not always simple. and It's not always easy to navigate. And remember, Peter is writing to a church that is suffering under the persecutions of Nero. I mean, they're going through it. They're dealing with it. And so I see truths in our salvation, but I also see rejoicing in our salvation. I know that kind of sounds backwards, but there's reasons to rejoice in our salvation. Notice what it says there in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. Rejoicing in our salvation. In this. The in this in, in verse 6 is, is naturally pointing us back to that first section that's dealing with the truths of our salvation. Right? In this, in our salvation, we rejoice. Right? We rejoice that we are saved. So Peter gives us a few things that we are that are involved in our rejoicing about salvation. And the first one, and I'm sorry, you're not going to like it. We are to rejoice in trials. Look at what it says there in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Right, Peter's writing saying, guys, I know you're going through it. I know you're being grieved by these trials. But notice he says, you know, it might be necessary for a little while. Even Peter's kind of acknowledging, like, it can't last forever. Jesus is forever. Right? The eternal nature of our salvation. Anything we go through in this life is, will only ever be temporary. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. We rejoice in our salvation even during trials. And now, notice the if. He says, if need be. Now, in the, some of you probably know where I'm going with this, but in the Greek, it's in the first class condition. Which means if, and it is so. We might say since. Since you need to go through these grievous trials. Since it is necessary that you have been grieved by these various trials. See, I think the grammar here is clear that trials is something that is going to happen. If you're not going through a trial right now, don't worry, you will. 
Let me encourage you this morning. <laughs> but even though we're going through a trial, maybe, maybe you're in one this morning. Maybe you're going through something. We're to rejoice, Scripture tells us. Right? We are to, to take these things and consider them opportunities to grow, to draw closer to him. I'll tell you what, when you're going through it, right, when you're in those trials, man, it seems a lot easier to be in prayer, doesn't it? It seems a lot easier to have a solid, strong prayer life. Again, Peter's going to continue this thought down in, in chapter 4. He says, Beloved, in verses 12 and 13, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Peter's like, man, I get it. You guys are going through it. You know, church history tells us that, that Peter was, was crucified upside down. Not before his wife was crucified in front of him. And he was crucified upside down because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified in the same manner his Lord was crucified. See, Peter's not... Sharing something he doesn't know anything about. Peter's been through the fiery trial. He'll go through it. He's writing during a time when, when the church is being persecuted. But he says, don't think it's some strange thing that's happening. Oh, what is this weird trial? I don't understand. He's like, no, it's, it's not some strange thing, but rejoice to the extent that you get to partake in the sufferings of Christ. That we get to share in him so that his glory, notice that, so that his glory, so that Jesus can be glorified and revealed. So that you can be glad with exceeding joy. Here's the thing, we should not be surprised when the trial comes, but rather... Make a choice. When that trial comes, we can either choose to be bummed out or we can choose to be blessed. We can choose to shake our fists at God or we can choose to rejoice. Lord, thank you. Let me praise you for the opportunity to go through what I'm going through, to draw closer to you, to learn to trust you more, to grow and mature in my faith. 1 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 4.15 says, For all things are for your sakes. All things. You know what all means in the Greek? All. And that's all that it means. All things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. All things are for your sakes. Even if it's a trial, it's for your sakes. Trials are for our, they're for us. They're not to bum us out, but to build us up, to bless us, to grow us, to mature us. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you want to grow in your faith? Do you want to mature as a Christian, as a believer? Do you want to be more Christ-like? Get ready to go through a trial. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul says it's just a momentary affliction. It's a momentary light 
affliction. And I know, right, we go through these things, and man, they don't feel light. They feel heavy most of the time. Rejoicing in our salvation through trials. How about testing? It's not just trials we rejoice in. We rejoice when we're being tested. Verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found a praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 tells us that not only will we go through trials, but we'll go through times of testing. Maybe this morning you're currently being tested. Maybe your faith is going through the fire. But you know what the fire does? It refines. It refines us. That's what he says there, right? As though... More precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Right? When you had precious metals and you wanted to remove those, those impurities from those precious metals, what they do is they throw, the, throw it in the fire. Right? And they let those impurities rise to the surface and then they'd scrape those impurities off. In fact, that metal worker would continue that process until he could see his reflection in the gold. Keep refining it. Keep heating it in the fire, scraping that dross off of it until he could see his reflection in it. You know, sometimes I think that's exactly what the Lord is doing with us. He's testing us. He's throwing us in the fire. Let that dross come to the surface, and he scrapes it off. And he keeps doing that until he can see his reflection in us. There I am. Now I can see myself. That's the process we go through as believers. And yeah, It's not a comfortable one when he throws us in the fire. But that means there's some refining that has to take place. There's some things that he wants to draw out of us. You ever wonder what's on the inside? Just get up in the middle of the night and stub your toe on the couch. You tell me what comes out. (laughs) Or when that person cuts me off on the freeway. What comes out? You see, we all need to be refined in the fire, right? I know I do. So that testing comes. But what does James tell us? Right? My brethren, count it all joy, what? When you fall into various trials, knowing that the what? The testing of your faith produces patience. The trials and the testings in our lives, it produces something within us. It produces patience. And having its perfect work that you might be complete, lacking nothing. Let patience have its perfect work in you. Let the trials and the testing of your faith move to completion so that when God looks in and sees you, he can see himself. He can see his reflection. Once again, we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to respond? Much like the trials we face, the testings that we are going through, it brings out, hopefully in us, spiritual maturity. James 1.12, he says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, that's that same word, tested, approved or tested, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. We rejoice in salvation through trials, through testing. And in verse 8, through trust. We trust him. Right? This, this, these trials and these testings of our faith, which hopefully, right, are going to bring out um, that we might be found to praise, honor, and glorify at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hopefully we're praising him, that our lives are glorifying to him, whom having not seen you, Love, sorry. Whom having not seen, you love, right? We haven't seen him. Peter is writing to the church in Asia Asia Minor that perhaps they didn't see him crucified. They didn't see a resurrected Lord, right? Jesus ascended into heaven 
decades ago. Right? It's been 30 decades, uh, sorry, 30 years, three decades. And so he's writing to, to believers that probably never saw the Lord, but yet they love him. And I'm encouraged by that because I haven't physically seen the risen Lord either, but I love him. I trust him. Whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. That we have an inexpressible joy for a Savior that we have not seen. We've experienced him, at least I hope we have, I pray we all have, had an experience with a risen Lord, but I've not seen him. That requires trust. It requires faith. Another reason to rejoice in our salvation is our trust in Jesus, believing without seeing, right? Hebrews 11.1 1 gives us the definition of faith, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. And, and probably the, the simplest example to that for me has always been like, you know, every one of you came in here this morning and sat down on those chairs. And not one of you inspected the welds to make sure it was going to hold you. Just, you sat down knowing and having faith that that chair was going to hold you. Hopefully that's the kind of faith we have in the Lord. We just trust him. We take him at his word. You know, the Old Testament saints, their faith looked forward to Christ. They were looking forward to him, longing for the day when they could see these things fulfilled. Our faith, we look back. We look back at the cross. We look back at a risen Lord. We weren't there. We look back to it, though, and we have faith. Jesus, talking to Thomas, right? Thomas saying, I'm not going to believe unless I can feel the holes in his hand. Touch the spear mark in his side. And Jesus says to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. And then he says, blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Man, those that have believed without seeing, man, they are blessed, he says. They have a blessing. Now, belief without seeing. You know, but I love it because our, our faith is, is founded upon facts, right? Right? Because our faith comes from the Word of God. You know, the, the, the Scripture, the Word of God is the only book in history that has never changed and will never change. That's why I love, right? That's why I wanted to read from Isaiah 40 this morning when we, we opened the service, right? The grass is going to fade, it's going to wither, but the Word of God is forever. It's forever. It's the only book in history that hasn't changed. History books have changed. Math books have changed. Archaeology books have changed and been rewritten. You know, every time an archaeologist digs something up out of the ground, it validates and confirms what Scripture has already said. You know, I love when people say, archaeology proves the Bible. No, the Bible proves archaeology. If you ask me if an archaeologist wants to know where to dig, read the Bible. It'll tell you. but we trust him. We take him at his word because he's given us his word. And then not only that, there's rejoicing in trials, there's rejoicing in testing, there's rejoicing in our trust of him, and there's rejoicing in our treasure. Verse 9 says, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of our souls. Man, that is a treasure to be sure the salvation of our souls. What is the end of our faith, verse 9 says? The salvation of our souls. Our faith is tried, our faith is tested, our faith requires trust, but in the end, it brings about treasure. It brings about the salvation of our souls. 
you know, the prophets looked forward to these things. You know, real, real quick, I know we have to wrap up here, but it says in verse 10, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or of what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified before him the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. See, the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament prophets, they looked forward to these things. Their faith was a forward-looking faith, right? That God would send that promised Messiah. But they didn't know when. They didn't know what it was going to look like. In fact, for them, the idea of a suffering servant, the idea of a Messiah to go to the cross and to die was all but foreign to them. They were looking for that conquering king, right? They were looking for the Messiah that we are waiting for, right? The one that's going to come on a white horse, right? Lord of lords and king of kings on his side, coming to rule and to reign, to establish his kingdom. That's the same Messiah that they were looking for. They weren't ready for one that would suffer and die. But they looked forward inquiring, searching these things out. Man, the prophets, I mean, and they, they, they knew, right? I mean, they prophesied of his birth, right? Isaiah 7 prophesied of a, a virgin birth. Micah 5, 2 prophesied that it'd be in Bethlehem. Daniel prophesied it'd be after, 60, uh, uh, after the 69 weeks or the 69 seven-year periods, right? They prophesied about his death. Right, Psalm 22, Zechariah 12, that he'd be um, pierced. Psalm 16, Psalm 49, talk about his resurrection. They knew these things, they prophesied these things, but with a veil, right? It was a mystery to them, they didn't fully understand it. The prophets were waiting and prophesying for the grace that is to come. They were messengers of a salvation that they may not have fully understood, but they searched and inquired the scriptures for these things. And while the prophets knew a lot and they understood a lot, they didn't know exactly what they were searching for. And the amazing thing is that we today, we get the opportunity to look back and see these things fulfilled, see their prophecies that have come true, You know, I'm not even, I forget exactly how many prophecies that Jesus literally fulfilled from the Old Testament. I think it was Chuck Missler that said that if you took just eight of those prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, right, like a virgin birth, like being born in Bethlehem, just take eight of those prophecies. The probability of one person in history fulfilling just eight of those things to the letter, the probability of that being true would be like taking the state of Texas and filling the state of Texas with quarters two feet deep and then taking one of those quarters, painting it red, chucking it somewhere in Texas, and then you dropping out a helicopter and finding it on the first one. Right? Like it, the probability. And yet we know that Jesus fulfilled a lot more than just eight of them. Right, the, the reliability of Scripture. That we now, from our vantage point, we now know and we understand all the things that the prophets wished they knew and understood. Right, we know, right, Paul says right, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The prophets look forward to a faith in Jesus. We look back at a risen Lord and we put our faith and our trust in him. But notice in verse 12, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel 
to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, the things which angels desire to look into. The prophets were messengers of salvation, but ultimately the Holy Spirit is the messenger of salvation. It was the Holy Spirit, right, that inspired them to write. It's the Holy Spirit that, that came upon the apostles in Acts chapter 2 that empowered them. Not only were the Old Testament prophets messengers, but the Holy Spirit as well. Jesus said in John 16, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, that we have a Holy Spirit given to us to minister. A Holy Spirit as the messenger of salvation. See, we have a gospel. We have a good news to take out to this world. Right, that we serve and we worship a risen Lord. Right, that we have a salvation that is trustworthy. We have a salvation that is worth rejoicing in. Even when trials come, even when the testing happens. When we feel that knife edge scraping the dross off of us. That we rejoice because we serve a risen Lord. Holy Spirit is the... Now don't misunderstand, right? We should be serving the Lord. We should be out there, right? Sharing the gospel and sharing the love of Christ with people. The Lord uses... He used the prophets just as he used the apostles and he uses us, right? As vessels to bring forth his message of the gospel. As long as we're careful to, to know... Right, that it's, it's, it's the Holy Spirit hopefully in us, working in and through us to reach those in our lives that are lost. The person next to us in the grocery store line or at the gas pump, those coworkers that can be difficult to work with. Hopefully it's not because I wax so eloquent or I'm well versed in Bible knowledge or have that nice four color gospel track. It's the Holy Spirit working in and through us that's been given to us to empower us. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts the world of sin and righteousness. And we get to be a part of it. We are vessels in his hand for his purposes, for his plans. You know, Jesus promised the coming of the Holy Spirit, right? And it was fulfilled there in Acts chapter 2, right? That the Holy Spirit comes alongside us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit comes upon us to empower us to do the work of the cross, to share that love, to share that gospel, to share that, that Jesus went and died for us so that we might be justified. He died for us that we might put on his righteousness. And so I think it's important as we, as we continue through this epistle, as, as, as Peter continues to instruct us, and really as Peter shows us how we are to conduct ourselves, in a world of suffering. That, that as he continues through this epistle, we need to hold firm to our, found, uh, our salvation, our foundation, that he is our rock. Anything else is sinking sand. That we need him. The, the title, the heading in your Bible above verse 3 probably says something similar to a heavenly inheritance. Right, our inheritance, what we gain from his death. And we are to cling to that and hold to it. And hopefully, right, through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, that we are just, we can't contain it, right? That, that joy, he says, inexpressible. Joy unspeakable, that we have so much joy. Like, happiness is conditional, Right? Like, there are things in life that make us happy, and there are things in life that bum us out, and they're, it's, they're conditional. But joy, joy goes beyond that. Joy is unconditional. Joy is inexpressible. We just have it. And why do we have it? Because we have had a real, tangible experience with a risen Lord who died for us. And man, the world needs to hear that. The world needs to know that. And so I pray, I hope... This encourages you this morning and as we go out into the world and we endeavor to conduct ourselves in a way that honors the Lord through our trials, through our 
our temptations, through our testing, that we rejoice in him as we worship him. So let's allow the Lord to, to work through us this week, you know, as we, as we consider him this, this coming week, you know, whatever it is that we're going through, you know, perhaps, perhaps you're in the fire, right? Perhaps you're in a trial. Just know that he's refining you. It's not arbitrary. It's not like the Lord looked down and went, whoops, didn't mean that for it to happen. You are where you are because he wants you there. Because there's something he, he wants to grow you in and mature you in. There's something that perhaps needs to be refined out of us. Right? Perhaps there's, there's some dross in our lives that can only come out through the fire. Let's embrace that this week and say, Lord, how can I trust you more? In what ways do I need to grow and mature? What ways, what needs to be removed from my life? You know, we were talking about this. I'm sorry I'm going long, but you know, we were talking about this Monday night, right? In our, in our study in Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, Paul says. It's reasonable. But he says to present your bodies a living sacrifice. And what we were talking about on Monday night was a sacrifice goes on the altar. A living sacrifice that we are to put ourselves on the altar. And the question we posed Monday night was, what is it in my life, what is it in your life that needs to go on that altar and say, Lord, this is yours now. I'm going to stop hanging on to this. I'm going to stop holding this just for me. I'm going to surrender it to you so that you can do the work you need to do in my life. And for each one of us, that thing that needs to hit the altar is going to be different. You know, and I love how the Lord works. You know, as we're studying the... the on Friday nights, the book of Leviticus, right, the altar comes up, and there were horns, right? Bind it to the horns of the altar. The sacrifice would be tied to the horns of the altar. You know, and myself, as a living sacrifice, will find my way off of that altar, off of that altar if I'm not careful. And that was something that came up on tonight, too. It was like, Lord, bind me to that thing. Keep me there so that I can serve you and be obedient to you. So I don't know what it is for you this morning. I don't know where you are. I don't know what trial or testing you're going through. I don't know if you're struggling to trust or to see the treasure that you have in Christ. But this week, let's hop on that altar and say, Lord, what is it that I need to surrender to you? What is it that belongs to you that I keep holding back? And so, Lord, I thank you. I praise you for this morning, Lord, and for your word and how it speaks and for how it ministers, Lord. And, and I acknowledge this morning, Lord, that Lord, that this life is not easy. And Lord, the trials come. The testing happens. And Lord, I'll speak for myself, Lord, that I want to embrace those things because I know that you've called me to them. Lord, I know that there are things in my life that are not fully surrendered. Lord, I know there are things that I need to give up. Lord, would you show me what they are. Would you reveal them to me, Lord, and give me the faith, the strength, Lord, the ability to be obedient and to turn those things over to you. Lord, would you show, Lord, would you show us how to rejoice in this salvation that we have? Lord, to rejoice through the suffering. Lord, we want to cling to you this week and trust you wholly and completely. So, Lord, would you refine us? Would you scrape the things off that need to be scraped and allow us, Lord, to come to a place where we, you can look down upon our lives, Lord, and see your reflection. Lord, may we reflect you this coming week. And so we thank you, we praise you for this morning, Lord. Go before us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.
right, so we're going to close in a song. Let's, uh, as we mentioned, Lord, let's just let's just worship the Lord. May it be the true reflection of our hearts as we worship Him.